Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Andy Arnold, CEO and Senior Wealth Advisor here at Centerline Wealth Advisors. So this is the third in our series we like to call Between the Lines. We wanted to create this forum to give you some insight into our internal analysis process and the thought leadership going on here at Centerline. We usually start this segment off with a little in-depth view of the markets and economy, but those seem to be enduring current headlines for the time being. Today, we have a very special guest, and so we'd like to devote our time to hearing from him and learning all about cryptocurrencies. I have to admit that I'm certainly interested in the technology uh, and the economic rationale behind crypto, uh, but the more conservative side of me is frankly a little bit scared by it. I remember a gentleman telling me about 25 years ago that he had his retirement uh, completely secure and didn't feel like he needed any financial planning or portfolio management help. When I quizzed him a little bit more, he told me his $3 million retirement was invested 100% in, yep, you guessed it, Beanie Baby Dolls. As we all know, that did not work out for him. While crypto might not be anything like Beanie Baby Dolls, I have to admit that the hype surrounding it does remind me of the bubble that was the Beanie Baby craze. So to set the record straight, calm my fears and teach us all we're going to get started. Ben Doniger, Centerline's resident CFP, is going to help me today interview Randy Frederick. Randy is the Managing Director of Trading and Derivatives at Schwab and is one of the smartest people I've ever met as it relates to cryptocurrencies. <laughs> Randy, welcome, and we all can't wait to hear what you have to say today. Well, thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you for having me. I hope I can live up to that wonderful introduction. Um, usually, um, yeah, well, we'll just skip it at that. I hope I can do, I'll do my best. I won't pretend to be an absolute expert on this topic, but it is a complex topic. Uh, it, this is the landscape of, for cryptocurrencies, um, decentralized finance, you name it, is changing so rapidly on a daily basis. Just trying to keep up with this truly, truly um, dizzying. So, but I, I do my best to try to be as informed as I can on the topic. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll just dive right into it. So let's talk a little bit about cryptocurrencies. And then I think, you know, at the end, maybe we'll do some questions. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to do that. But let's just jump right in. But th to talk about cryptocurrencies, what we first has to have to do, I think, is back up a little bit. Let's do a little history and talk about alternative currencies. So I know many of the attendees here have probably been around a while like I have. And I remember as a child going to the Kroger grocery store with my mother, where they gave her these little yellow stamps called top value stamps. I know other grocery stores used to use a stamp called SNH Green Stamp. These are alternative currencies that have literally been around for over a hundred years. They were given out, they had value, but they only had value to the actual issuers themselves. They have no value in any other context except at the places that give them to you. But they could, if you collected enough of them, be used for products and services. Today, we have many other existing programs that are very similar. Uh, frequent flyer miles from airlines, loyalty points from hotels like Marriott and, and, um, and Hilton, credit card points from Visa and MasterCard and others. These are all forms of alternative currencies. Cryptocurrencies are just a digital version of an alternative currency. So how do they differ? The way they differ is that most of the alternative currencies that I mentioned can only be spent or redeemed with the actual issuer. So you can think of almost as, again, Kroger as a bank or, or Top Value as a bank that gives you its own personal money that you can then spend only with them. Uh, but the difference is a cryptocurrency or a digital currency could actually be spent at any business as long as that business is willing to accept it. And at this point, the number of businesses willing to let you spend Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies is still relatively small, but that number is growing every day. And there are a number of reasons that we're going to cover for why a lot of places don't accept them just yet. Um, it is small, but it is growing. So here's just a small list of some bigger companies, well-known companies that do accept cryptocurrencies. Companies like PayPal, who recently launched a, a Bitcoin um, uh, exchange operation. Microsoft, Whole Foods, which of course is part of the Amazon business, uh, and Home Depot. Now here's the thing, a lot of these guys don't have the technology to actually manage the crypto uh, process it themselves. So they partner with a third party application, which makes that process a little bit cumbersome. Um, you not you can't just go into a Home Depot with a couple of two by fours and pay with Bitcoin at the checkout counter. It's a little bit trickier than that. If you buy something online, you have to use this third party intermediary that they've partnered with. 
Um, here's another big reason why Bitcoin in particular and many of the other cryptocurrencies really just don't work too well as currencies. They are taxed by the IRS currently as property, which means anytime you use Bitcoin to purchase a product, you're actually going to trigger a capital gains or potentially a capital loss obligation. Now, the weird part about that is normally if you have a capital gain, like with your broker, they'll send you a 1099 and you'll know what that is. That doesn't happen just yet, although there are pending laws in place that will, that will change that in the near future. So can you imagine every time you spent Bitcoin, you'd actually have to file uh, on your taxes the following spring, whether it was a capital gain or whether it was a capital loss. It would get really complicated if you were buying pizzas and coffee at Starbucks with Bitcoin. So you can see the challenge there. Now, let's talk about Bitcoin specifically. And then a lot of times we use Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies interchangeably because Bitcoin is overwhelmingly the best known, the largest and, uh, and the most valuable of all the cryptocurrencies. Uh, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. That, the terms that are used interchangeably are virtual currency, digital currency, cryptocurrency, all pretty much mean the same thing. It is definitely, as I said, the most widely recognized cryptocurrency. It's been around the longest. The whole concept actually started only back in 2008, so it's not been that long, uh, but it's still longer than all the others. It definitely has the largest market cap, and certainly people recognize it more so than any other. And the main reason is it just has first mover advantage. It was the first one. And so people know it. I mean, many of you can think back to the days when refrigerators were called frigid airs and vacuum cleaners were called Hoovers. I still use the term Kleenex for a tissue. Those were first mover advantages that stuck around for a very long time. Crypto or uh, Bitcoin is still pretty much gaining and um, benefiting from that advantage. The whole purpose, the whole reason why Bitcoin and uh, to begin with, and now all the other cryptocurrencies originally came about was somebody wanted a way where two people could exchange a product for, uh, for a currency um, or transact some sort of business, and it wouldn't require government intervention or a big bank like Bank of America or Citibank or someone to be involved in that. That was the intent, to make it cheap and easy for people to send money. And if any of you have ever used an application like Venmo, where you zap money from one person to another, same concept, although to do that, you're typically linked up to a bank account, so there's still a traditional bank behind it. But imagine if you could completely eliminate that bank. Now, of course, those banks aren't real happy about this idea because um, it could essentially wipe out their entire business model. That's why you hear people like Jamie Dimon, one of the best known banking CEOs there is, constantly talking negative about Bitcoin and other cryptos, while at the same time, his bank is adding all sorts of crypto businesses in the background and investing in it himself. Because... When you're in a business that you can see is potentially about to become obsolete, even if that's 10 or 20 years down the road, you don't want to rest on your laurels. Ask anybody who worked for Blockbuster Video, and you know what I'm talking about. So how would you be able to buy a Bitcoin? Well, the simplest way is to set up an account. You can typically download an app from a company like Coinbase or many others. There's, there's lots of them out there, and you can just buy it right there on your phone. You can link up your account. So for example, I have a, an account with Coinbase that I've had for many years. I linked up a checking account that I have at a small bank, and I'm able to transfer money over via an automated clearinghouse transaction, also known as an a ACH or at Schwab, we use the term money link. They all mean the same thing. You move money over there, and then you can buy these, these coins on an exchange. Um, Coinbase is the largest of the exchanges. It's also the only one so far that has actually gone public uh, with an IPO, in fact, earlier this year. You can also provide a product or a service for Bitcoin. As I mentioned with, with Home Depot, you can't necessarily use Bitcoin at a checkout lane, but you can buy it through the, their, their app on, the, on the internet if you wanted to buy something online off of the uh, you know, homedepot.com. You can also, and this is fascinating, if you haven't done this, you should do this. Next time you, you go, you set physical foot inside of a gas station, and frankly, I don't do that very often because I just use my card out at the pump like most people do. But the next time you walk inside of a gas station, take a look around and see if you can find an ATM somewhere. Chances are pretty good in most gas stations. If you find an ATM, you will find another little machine next to it that looks like the one in this slide here that is actually a Bitcoin ATM, or a, it's not technically an ATM, but it's a similar type of machine. You can actually feed dollar bills into a machine like that. When you're done, you can pull up your cell phone, display a QR code on your phone that represents a digital wallet where you maintain your cryptocurrencies the machine will then zap the Bitcoin that you just purchased or any other cryptocurrency into your phone, into your digital wallet in that manner. 
Now, why would somebody do that as opposed to simply going on to you know, a, a little app on their cell phone and buying it that way with money out of their bank? Well, the reason is it's anonymous that way. Nobody knows where it is. If you maintain, and I think this is frankly risky because you could drop your phone in the water, uh, it could be stolen, you could, you could break it, but you can actually store cryptocurrencies offline onto an, a device. You could use a flash drive, you can use your, your phone. There are companies that actually sell digital little gizmos that are sort of like a flash drive where you can save them, but then you have the same risk you have in owning actual cash, right? Someone can steal your wallet. Your cash can be left in your pants when it goes through the washing machine. There are all kinds of things like that that can cause problems. You can do a similar thing with your uh, with a crypto wallet. The other way to obtain a Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency is to do a mining operation. You've probably heard of cryptocurrency mining. This gets a lot of attention because cryptocurrency mining is extremely energy intensive. There are mountains and mountains of servers using what's called an ASIC chip, which is a single a uh, semiconductor chip is defined specifically for the purposes of doing these complex mathematical calculations in order to earn Bitcoin. Um, as time goes on, because of the way the original code was written, this complex, this complex mathematical calculation gets more and more and more complex, and the rewards for doing so get smaller and smaller and smaller. So it requires more computers working faster, longer, and sucking up enormous amounts of energy. This is one of the big negatives to the whole concept of mining. But there are lots of clever people out there who are figuring out ways to make this work. Uh, here in Texas, where I live, there are places way out in the middle of nowhere where no one wants to live, where there's oil wells that are drilling oil and flaring off wasted natural gas. There are some clever people that have gone out and put natural gas running generators on those sites parked next to an empty mobile home full of servers doing crypto mining. Now, you wouldn't necessarily say that that's green, but it is energy neutral because it is essentially using energy that would have otherwise been wasted. You also see people setting up uh, crypto mining operations in places where there's hydroelectric power. The more recent one, which I think is really fascinating is that you know, nuclear energy has a negative connotation for a lot of people. And in many places, people don't want it. So people who operate nuclear power plants are trying to figure out ways to stay relevant. They've partnered with cryptocurrency mining operations who will actually park on site and use the, the nuclear energy. And then all the people in the community can say they're not using it. It's a fascinating thing, the way it works. Uh, so lots of clever things going on there. Now, here's the big question, I think. And it's a big question for everyone is always, well, should I own some, right? Well, I mean, the question is kind of like, should you own lottery tickets? You know, if you want to spend a couple of dollars a week buying lottery tickets, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're not counting on that as your primary retirement plan. Um, or like Andy said at the beginning, you know, there's nothing wrong with putting what I've been recommending is 1% of your portfolio into cryptocurrencies. Look, everybody can afford a 1% loss in their portfolio. It happens almost daily with the vol volatility in the marketplace. And we can all bounce back from 1%. But if you put 1% in there and it gets totally wiped out, it's not the end of the world. On the other hand, if that 1% turns into 10% over a couple of years, then it would have been well worth it. So same sort of thing. But the thing about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is they're not traditional commodities or currencies. As I mentioned, while we call them cryptocurrencies, they're taxed like property. Uh, certain types of cryptocurrencies, because there are different types, will be treated more like commodities. Others will be treated more like property. Uh, but in any case, they're not really looked at as being a currency or a commodity, which is one of the ways that you often diversify a, um, or, you know, or get different exposure uh, and help lower the overall beta of, an, of a diversified portfolio is by looking at things like commodities and other non-correlated assets. So you have to just kind of think of it as a speculative investment and use, again, cash that you can afford to lose. Um, but honestly, given this industry and where it's moving, and, and I, I try very hard not to be an advocate or, a, or a, an opponent to, to crypto. I try to take an open-minded approach to all of this. Um, it's not the end of the world to put a few dollars into it if you, if, you, if you think, well, hey, I don't want to miss the boat on this. But the challenge we have is like, honestly, with any investment that you could possibly imagine, putting all of your assets or even a substantial portion of them in it is just foolish. It, it's always been foolish to do something like that. Yeah, you know, we, what, hear, we hear stories like that where, where people will take, you know, they're sort of betting the farm on this is going to help them retire in three years because, they hate their job, so they put everything they can. I even overheard a conversation where somebody borrowed money on their credit card to invest in it, 
uh, and and those those kind of stories really uh, really make me nervous. Yeah, and and again, I mean, and this is the challenge with the younger group, and one of the reasons why they need financial advice. Um, something like forty percent of all the people out there in the market right now started trading since the pandemic hit in March of 2020. That's a little scary when you think about it, and many of them. I talk to people every day, young people especially, who, who will tell me that day. You know, I'm just, I would, I, I had a friend that, who told me I would never put any of my assets into a company. And I'm like, what do you mean a company? You mean like buying equity, like a stock? He's like, yeah, it's ridiculous. And, and I just, I just walked away at that point because I knew what he was trying to tell me was that he has all of his assets in cryptocurrencies. And it's just, it's scary to just think about that. Um, I mean, yes, if you get into the right one at exactly the right time, um, and get out at exactly the right time. But the problem with a lot of these people is all they ever do is buy and hold. They don't really ever sell. And you and I, we all know this, that, you know, uh, a profit's not a profit till it's been a real, becomes a realized gain. And you can look very wealthy on paper and then tomorrow it's gone. So we, we just can't, we got to continue to sort of beat that drum that diversification and asset allocation is the key. And, you know, we all do that all the time. And even I, who am a, I'm, I'm, I'm an active trader analyst, my tagline for every presentation I ever give is that, look, 80% of your portfolio at least should always be in a long-term asset allocation plan. If you want to trade actively, 20% of that max. And then let's talk. And I'll tell you, you know, how we can do sort of, you know, tactical type things. But the core of everyone's portfolio has to be long-term focused. All right. So what is Schwab's perspective on this? Well, I mean, we've kind of been covering it already. Virtual currencies are very volatile. I mean, honestly, literally just before this presentation, Bitcoin has dropped 30 percent in the last 30 days. Think about that. Can you imagine the S&P 500 dropping 30 percent in 30 days? Yes, it's happened. We've all most of us probably remember what happened in the fall of 2008 and spring of 2009. Many of us who've been around 30 plus years like I have um, probably also remember what happened you know, in late 1999, up until the spring of 2000, when the internet thing blew up, right? We all kind of remember those days. Um, but that is a, an earth shattering decline, 30% in the S&P 500 over a month. That's what we've seen in Bitcoin. And that's just common, normal, everyday thing. I don't know about you, but I don't want that kind of volatility in my portfolio. I just wouldn't. Um, and there's no guarantee that it's going to come back. Obviously, we don't know that there's a guarantee that the S&P 500 will ever come back. We only have 200 years of history to rely on in that case, as opposed to about 12 years. So, <laughs> so again, uh, it's purely speculative. You have to think of it that way. You have to think about it in terms of using only expendable money. Now let's readdress this issue uh, of currency again. Some people will think of it as a currency. That's kind of a matter of opinion. So there are usually three cri criteria that are used to define a currency. Is it a medium of exchange? Yes, it can be, but as I said, it can be extremely cumbersome to do so. And to trigger a capital gains or loss obligation every time you used it for that is just really ridiculous. You wouldn't want that. Can it be a unit of account? Yeah, sort of. I mean, uh, you can translate Bitcoin into dollar on it at any given time. So in theory, it is a unit of account. Lastly, can it be a store of value? Yes, probably. I'd say it qualifies pretty well on the third one um, in the sense that while it has had enormous volatility on a pretty regular basis, uh, it hasn't gone back to zero and it hasn't been wiped out. Although there are some that have been, Bitcoin itself has not. Uh, so you could probably argue that, um, but Bitcoin's got high volatility. As I said, the processing speeds are actually slower. That was one of the original plans for using an alternative currency was to have the process of moving money from one place to another. If you've ever sent a Fed wire um, to, to purchase a, you know, on a home or something, it takes a couple hours. That's not too bad actually. Um, but if you have ever bought anything with a credit card at a bank, when you slide your card through that machine or stick it in the slot, how long does it take before Visa or MasterCard or Discover approves that transaction? You know, anywhere from about one to 15 or 20 seconds. That's pretty quick. Bitcoin doesn't necessarily operate that fast. Uh, it's, it's actually a little slower than you might expect. So I think there's going to, it's going to take a lot of change. And I really think while maybe some cryptocurrency at some point may be used as a medium of exchange. It's doubtful that Bitcoin ever will. Uh, what will be likely is what's called a central bank digital currency, also often uh, referred to as a CBDC. Uh, and that is, say, something like a cryptocurrency that is controlled instead by the Federal Reserve, which just means a dollar, right? I mean, frankly, I don't, I'm not young. I'm well into my 50s, but like most people, I don't carry a lot of cash. I carry cash for tips and things like that, but 
I'd say nine out of 10 times when I go into any store, restaurant or any or gas station, I use a card. That's digital currency too. So who is the central authority behind all this? If you're going to remove the Federal Reserve and you're going to get Citibank and Bank of America and MasterCard and Visa and everybody else out of the picture, well, who the heck is in charge? That's what scares me. What's, who's in charge is a consortium, a group of people who were early adopters, who were some of the early miners. Uh, in some cases, it might even be some of the people who, were, who sort of defined some of the code early on, a group of people called the Bitcoin Foundation. Um, you could call them early enthusiasts. You know, one of the things I've learned over the years is that where there is big money, there will always be fraud, always. And we know from history, time and time and time again, it's very difficult for any organization, any company, any group to self-police. We're seeing these, these um, types of discussions going on with all the social media companies just yesterday, in fact, that they can't police themselves. Why? Because there's too much profit motivation there. And that's one of the dangers of this. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the dangers here as we move forward. So where- Randy, uh, uh, Randy yeah. your, your, your slides have uh, slipped off the screen. If you could uh, share, yeah. share, those, uh, share those back up with us, that'd be great. Yeah, I think uh, one of the comments I always make is that if you put a fox in charge of the hen house, uh, hens are going to disappear every single time, 100%. So uh, your comments are, are right on. You may need to share screen at the bottom. Yeah, let me, I, I don't know what happened to it. It just stopped sharing for some reason. Let's try this again. There we go. Are you getting it? I don't know why it happened. I, for some reason, it just stopped. Okay. It's okay. Perfect. Okay. So, um, yeah. so where does the value of Bitcoin come from? Really, Bitcoin like a piece of art, like a... An, an antique car, like a, a rare coin, a stamp, is truly a, is only valuable because someone thinks it has value. Now, you could argue that, you know, in fact, frankly, gold. Uh, I always think that really the truest and best analogy for what a Bitcoin is, is to think of it as a gold coin. Gold, like unlike many other metals, has very few industrial uses. I mean, platinum and others have a lot of uses. Silver, Gold doesn't get used a whole lot for anything other, mostly than just jewelry and ornamentation and things like that. The only value that gold has is because it's rare, um, it's hard to obtain, and because we think it's attractive. Uh, we don't really have that third characteristic with Bitcoin at all. It's hard to see something that doesn't truly exist except in you know ones and zeros on, an, on the internet as being attractive. Um, so it's driven primarily just by supply and demand and by this perception, and I, and I want to emphasize that word, a perception of scarcity, and a belief that, as we talked about, that it could be a store of value, that it could be a, a hedge against inflation, although I will tell you that the data about Bitcoin being an inflation hedge has been horrible lately. It is not even coming close to hedging against inflation, and a good example is that, of that is just literally look at the calendar year 2021. Go back and look at all the times that the S&P 500 fell. Bitcoin went down as well, as well. In fact, we just recently had a little bit of a dip and it went down in that case also. And on top of that, there were other times when for no particular reason, Bitcoin also dropped sharply when the S&P 500 was doing just fine. What we have not seen, which would typically imply a hedge against inflation or at least a diversification characteristic, is that Bitcoin goes up when S&P 500 goes down. We haven't seen that either. So that particular issue has shown very little, um, there's very little proof to show that you're getting any kind of an inflation hedge or a whole lot of diversification, maybe a, maybe a little bit on that one. Um, but again, Bitcoin, unlike, or not, I'm sorry, not unlike gold, is not backed by a government. It's not backed by a bank. It's there, this perceived uh, scarcity. Uh, but the thing is, traditional and metrics don't apply. How do you value it? It's extremely difficult to value something that's so esoteric. There's no earnings, there's no revenue, there's no dividends, there's no interest. So you don't have a CEO, you don't have a price to earnings ratio, you don't have a book value. All of those things are also true about gold, but at least with gold, it is something you can physically hold in your hand. Um, but other than that, it's got a lot of the same lack of characteristics for assessing evaluation. Um, but yet it's worth an enormous amount of money. So let's talk about it. And this number is a little outdated because it was a week ago that I put this together. And as I said, Bitcoin's fallen sharply since then. But at the last, uh, when I did the last calculation at 56,000 per coin, I think today it's around 49. The total value of all the Bitcoins in the universe that people own is well over a trillion dollars, 1.1 trillion dollars. 
Now, that's a big number. That number exceeds the combined market capitalization of Pepsi, Boeing, M McDonald's, and Home Depot combined. So it is not insignificant by any stretch. Now, let's look at it the other direction. It is relatively small if you compare it to the value of all the existing outstanding gold bullion that we are aware of is over 11 trillion. So it's a ten about a tenth of that value. And if you compare it to the entire aggregate value of all the stocks in the S&P 500, that's about $38 trillion. But still, by no means is that an insignificant number. Now, here's the interesting thing. When this concept was first created and this blockchain code was first set up, there were some brilliant ideas in it that had not existed before. One is that there will never be more than 21 million coins. One of the things that, that people with a very libertarian perspective people who distrust the government immensely um, often complain about is the fact that the dollar is constantly being re devalued. And in fact, we are now experiencing the highest inflation we've had in 30 plus years. And you could argue the dollar is being devalued as a result. If there were a fixed number of dollars that could not be changed, going back to say perhaps the gold standard, then chances are the dollar would not get devalued. It would go up. And that's partly what we're seeing here. There is a maximum number of Bitcoin that can ever be created of 21 million. Now, out of that 21 million, about 14.8 million of them have already been created. But unfortunately, like I mentioned earlier, if you have your Bitcoin stored on a paper wallet, on a digital wallet, um, if you forgot your password, whatever, about 4 million of those are lost. That's a lot of money, 4 million Bitcoins that just don't exist anymore uh, because they've been lost and no one's been able to obtain uh, to get them back. You know, someone's computer blue screened and they forgot to store it. There, those kinds of dangers are just out there. But there's a large demand. A lot of people want to, want to own it. And it's a relatively small supply. The other thing is because it's a highly unregulated market, it's a very fragmented market. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of different places around the world where you can buy um, cryptocurrencies. And many of them operate uh, in the shadows. They, they are headquartered in places like the Cayman Islands, some of them argue they don't even have a headquarters. They have no physical presence whatsoever. The people who work there operate independently from their houses, and there really is no central headquarters, if you will. Um, that makes a lot of people very uncomfortable. So, Randy, I have to, I have to ask, With huh? you're saying almost a third of the outstanding circulating Bitcoin have been lost by individuals who forgot their password or lost their wallet or... Yep. That <laughs> reinforces the conservative uh, scaredy cat piece of me again in, in this whole thing. And, and if that's only happened in 12 years, how many are going to be lost you know, over the next 20? And if it's limited to 21 million, are we going to get to a place where 20 of the 21 million are at some point lost? Because as it circulates and people trade it, and I, I don't know. I, again, I'm dumbfounded that that number is so large. I don't think that'll happen. And the reason I don't is because they keep in mind, a lot of these were lost in the early days when Bitcoin was oh. worth one hundredth of a penny each. And now that they're worth, you know, $40,000 each, uh, it's unlikely that people are as careless as they might have been back yeah, then. True. Um, so I don't think so. If I had to guess, I would say somewhere maybe in the five million range will ultimately end up being lost. But the way the algorithm is set up, this mining process, as I said, over time gets more and more complex. The creation is uh, the reward is smaller. So the, it ends, it, I, I forget the date, I think it's 2030, I think it is around 2030 or so that it actually uh, ends. And then all 21 million will have been created and there won't be any more. So there's no dilution, but that is an illusion as well. And here's why. There's nothing that prevents somebody else from creating a new type of cryptocurrency that's not Bitcoin. And in fact, there are thousands of them now. You can't create more actual Bitcoin, but Bitcoin has also gone through a process called forking, which is when some of the people in the original consortium don't agree on how things should go, they split it in half. I almost kind of think of this as being like a stock split, right? In one way where maybe, you know, I only own one Bitcoin. I have some Bitcoin I owned for several years that split off. And now I have two little teeny tiny pieces of another thing called Bitcoin Cash and another one called Bitcoin Gold that were forks or almost all, I, you could almost think of it like a stock dividend that spun off of those earlier. In a sense, that does kind of dilute it a little bit. So there, there are some things like that that actually can happen. 
Um, plus, back back to my analogy, another factory comes online to pump out more Beanie Babies, they're, thereby diluting the market, driving down prices. Yeah, I'll stop with the Beanie Baby toy, analogy. That, yeah, even another toy that's not a Beanie Baby that someone thinks is even more interesting, right? At least for the temporary, you know, for a while, right? But, you know, there's been huge, there's been huge moves. Uh, as I said, not only have we had a 30% down move, we've had bigger moves. Bitcoin went up a thousand percent in 2017. I would be think you'd be hard pressed to find more than one or two stocks out there in the S&P, probably not in the S&P 500 at all. Some really small cap stocks that might have done that. Uh, it was up 130 percent this year. Earlier, before we had a, several drawdowns of the 30, 40 percent range. So there's been a lot of volatility. Um, and again, unfortunately, one thing that young people seem to suffer from a whole lot more than old guys like us is fear of missing out or what they call FOMO. Uh, they don't want to miss. They, they, they've always, they're afraid that, that this is the next big thing and they're going to be very fabulously wealthy. But we all know that there aren't a whole lot of shortcuts um, to, to wealth. And the vast majority of us will never get rich quick or easy. Um, we can all get rich slowly, which is what investing is all about. Now, some of the big questions that tend to come up on this is, well, gosh, what happened if Bitcoin went off a cliff? What if instead of a 30% drawdown, we had a 70 or 80 or 90% drawdown? Could it crush the financial markets the way that the, you know, uh, that the, that the housing de derivatives that Wall Street was playing around with did back in, in 07 and 08, you know, collateralized mortgage obligations and things like that? Is that possible? Well, truth is, we don't know. No one really knows. What we do know is that the ownership, the institutional level ownership in, in cryptos is relatively small still right now. But anything that can create a panic or a fear can cause people to act irrationally. And we've seen that happen before. Uh, there are foreign exchanges out there like Binance. In many cases, they've been very heavily restricted in what they can do in the US um, that offer leverage. Uh, you know, as if Bitcoin's not, I mean, I don't know about you, uh, but, and I, and I trade options and I teach options and I have for 30 plus years. Leverage on, a, on an asset that can move 30% in a couple of days is, is probably not a very good idea. There are companies out there like Binance and FTX. These are crypto exchanges that are, are offering as much as 90% leverage on cryptocurrencies. And as we all know, when you get a downturn, you get margin calls and you end up selling at an absolute worst price possible, which just causes it to more selling, which creates you know, downside uh, messes. And we've seen that happen when uh, when the market goes through a correction, you hit about an 11, 12% correction in the market and it starts to get kind of ugly because of margin calls. Well, in, in 1929, 90% uh, was the maximum margin rate. So exactly many right. researchers think that helped, uh, if it didn't help precipitate the Great Depression, it certainly uh, dug a, a much deeper hole. So yeah, it, seeing that number on the screen <laughs> makes me nervous. Yeah, it certainly, it certainly contributed to the crash of the market, whether that was you know what caused the depression or not. And as you said, shortly after that, that's when Reg T was created, which requires 50% leverage. And frankly, we've been there ever since. So yes, I do think that kind of margin is, is ludicrous. But when you're operating completely, um, completely um, without any regulatory oversight, uh, you can do whatever you want. And if you can get people to give you money, why not? I mean, that's what people, that's kind of how these exchanges have, have been set up. Um, there are big companies out there like Tesla, for example. I mean, I, everybody follows Elon. He's a, he's, you know, he's a mad scientist, clearly one of the most brilliant people of our times and also a total whack job at times. Um, but he has put lots of money into Bitcoin at times and other cryptocurrencies. Um, MicroStrategy is another one. If you talk to the guy that runs MicroStrategy, he, you know, I, I, this is not a commentary about the company itself, but he sounds very confident about the future of cryptos and, and he seems to really know what he's talking about. But there again, that stock's going to fluctuate a lot relative to the price of Bitcoin because they own so much of it. Uh, now, you know, there are countries that are getting involved here. El Salvador, for example, just adopted Bitcoin as its legal tender in September of this year. And you might think, why in the world would anybody want to adopt a currency that could go down 30% in a month? Uh, when you think about the fluctuations of the dollar, it's minuscule compared to that. Well, the reality is there are countries like like El Salvador, and let's think about the more recent one, Turkey, where you've got crazy swings, crazy volatility in their home currencies, so much so that the people who live and work there, the, you know, the people who are the working class who make very little income, they could see the value of their paycheck wiped out in a day, even with the volatility that cryptocurrencies have, or especially Bitcoin, it's far less disruptive. It's a better store of value than their home country's currency. It's probably not the best choice, 
But given the two choices that they've been given, it's pretty good. Of course, the problem you run into there is that many of those poor countries, you've got people who don't have cell phones, who don't have access to broadband internet. It's kind of difficult to transact business in Bitcoin if you don't have a phone and you don't have internet app, uh, access, which is what you kind of need. You can't, again, there is no physical Bitcoin anymore. Uh, now, when that happened, they had some problems when they first initiated that, and it caused a 16% what they call flash crash in Bitcoin literally on one day. Uh, Bitcoin also uh, fell about 50% just between March and May of this year. And as I said here, in just the last 30 days, it was down 30%. So it can be highly volatile. Now, here's a fascinating statistic, and I've seen it a number of times, and I don't know where it comes from, so I can't verify the actual calculation. But something like 95% of all the Bitcoin in existence are owned by only about 2% of the, of the shareholder account holders. And I think part of the reason for that is these are the people who were the very, very, very earliest adopters where, you know, again, for a hundred bucks, you could go out and buy, you know, 5,000 or 50,000 Bitcoin when it was really, really cheap. Um, I doubt that it's, uh, you know, people who are in buying it right now. That is a little bit of a concern, but it also might, surprisingly, that level of concentration might actually reduce the likelihood of a, of a financial calamity because those people, if they own that much of it, can probably withstand it and it's not going to create a run if there's not that many people involved. I don't know. I'm kind of mixed on how how the impact of that you know could happen if it uh, if we did have a big downturn. Right. If they if they those two percent woke up and thought, well, there's something better than Bitcoin coming out tomorrow, they could all rush for the exits and say, well, I better lock in these profits now. So on the one hand, yeah, I I, I can see that. And and by the way, uh, anybody that wants to ask questions at, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A button, so you could. Uh, if you're thinking of questions, you can type them in there and, and we'll try to get to those uh, near the end. Okay, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. I'm, I can talk pretty fast here, so we have okay. time for that. So uh, why are there no Bitcoin ETFs? The SEC, Gary Gensler specifically, and his predecessor said, look, this is too volatile. It's too dangerous. It's too fragmented. It's under-regulated. There's too much risk. We just can't do it. But just a couple of months ago, Gensler said, but I would be open to the idea of an ETF that invested in Bitcoin futures. Why did he say that? Because the futures market was already established and it's already regulated by the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And as a result, immediately, two Bitcoin futures um, funds launched right away. Um, a third one launched shortly thereafter. We are expecting several more. Um, so... That market is developing, but one of the challenges you run into with futures is that futures have a lot of, there's going to be a, what's called a tracking error, a difference between what the actual futures fund will trade at and what the Bitcoin spot price will trade at. Why? Well, one, it, you can't buy and sell futures contracts for free. There's some kind of a transaction cost. Two, you've got carrying costs for money spent in, in the exchanges. And three, most of the time, futures markets are in what's called contango, which is a later expiring contract, has a higher value than a near expiring contract. So each time your existing contracts expire, you then have to replace them with further out contracts, which cost more. So as a fund that has operating expenses, every single time you have to roll those contracts over, it's going to eat away at your return. And eventually um, it's going to eat up a lot of the profits. So we have seen already in only the first 30 days that these new Bitcoin futures funds have been underperforming the Bitcoin itself specifically for that reason. So it's not an ideal scenario um, although you do have some of the investor protections that you would typically get with an ETF, and you can do it in, an, in a regular brokerage account like you, um, rather than having to set up an account with, uh, with one of these crypto exchanges. But here's the thing. So there are 7,600, literally 7,600 different, it's probably 7,700 by today, different digital currencies out there. And there are about 14,000 different products. And the reason I say products is because you might have heard the term NFT, which stands for non-fungible token. This is a piece of digital art that is controlled by a blockchain type of thing. You've heard of decentralized finance. So this is loans and, and, uh, and savings and credit cards and all these different things that are in some way or form linked to a blockchain, which is you know kind of, again, the infrastructure that underlies cryptocurrencies. 14,000 different products, more being launched literally every day. It's massive. And as I said, just simply trying to keep up with what's going on is head spinning at times. Um, the market cap, uh, there are a hundred different cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin that already have a market cap exceeding a billion dollars. Um, and there's several that are, have more than 50 billion, ones that you've probably heard of Bitcoin. The second largest one is Ethereum. There's Cardano. 
uh, Binance Coin, Tether, and Solana. These are all cryptos that exist that are well known that trade actively, each of which has a market cap exceeding 50 billion. That's a big company if you think about it, right? So what are the benefits of buying Bitcoin and other cryptos? Obviously, the, the biggest one is the potential profit. You know, So Bitcoin's price, as I said, in 2017, went up 1,000%. This little joke of a coin called Dogecoin, which you probably heard about, literally went up 11,000% in, uh, in 2021. But it has dropped a lot since then. So there again, stocks do go down, and so do cryptocurrencies. Uh, Cardano went up 1,300% in 2021. As I said, there are, there are young entrepreneurs out there who have a, a sort of a libertarian perspective, who distrust the government immensely, who would love to see business transacted without the government's hands being involved. But I say, be careful what you wish for, because when you do that, you create all sorts of potential for fraud and theft and money laundering and every other sort of bad thing that happens when it comes to money. So as I said, not everyone sees that as a potential advantage. But think about it this way. Imagine, you know, I used to do a, a fair amount of business travel. I don't since COVID. But when I traveled internationally, one of the things I found always the most frustrating, what I hated the most about international travel was having to go through those, those currency exchange places at the airports or wherever. And they always ream you on the difference between the bid and the ask. And, and you always end up with this bucket of currency left over when you're done that you got to either give away or something. It's such a hassle. And the spread between what they'll give you and what they'll pay you is just, it's terrible. It would be so nice to go anywhere and just use the same currency. And I know a lot of, you know, first world countries will take uh, credit cards and everything else. And that makes it a lot easier, but not everybody will do that. If you've ever traveled to a, uh, a slightly underdeveloped country, many places it's cash only and they won't deal with that. So, uh, but it would be really nice to be able to do that. It would make travel simpler. It would make, make international commerce simpler. Uh, no currency exchanges. You could eliminate the issue of currency fluctuation. That would be really nice. Think about it, though. What happens if a government gets into trouble? You know, a lot of times if there's a recession, a government can inflate itself out of a recession. We've seen that happen in this country and in many others. Um, but you also have sometimes uh, corrupt governments. As I mentioned, Turkey is one of the examples, I think, where right now part of the challenge they have with their currency and their inflation issues has to do with the government and how it's run. Um, so there are all kinds of positives and potential negatives to that. Now let's talk a little bit more about the risks. As I said, you can store a cryptocurrency on a physical wallet. I have one that's actually an old one. It's a piece of paper. Literally, it has two QR codes, one on the outside that's called the public code, and one on the inside that's the private code. I can share the public code with someone I want to transact business with, but I don't share the private code because that's kind of like, you know, almost like your password to your account, if you will. Um, but that could get burned up. It's a piece of paper, or I could lose it, or I could get in, the, you know, put through the washing machine, or who knows what. Uh, so I don't keep a whole lot on that. I use it. I keep it mostly now. It's there's nothing on it anymore. But I used to have like a hundred dollars on it, just so that I can show it to people and see what it looks like. Um, but again, your security and what you own is only as safe as the company that you choose to do business with, right? I mean, we rely on on companies like Charles Schwab and Citibank and Bank of America and whomever to, to protect our assets, to protect our money. And if something goes wrong, then we've got FDIC or we've got, you know, um, we've got other types of, uh, you know, CIPIC and other things to protect if something goes wrong, um, that people will step in, the regulators will step in and protect you. And in fact, I mean, if you've ever had any, your credit card stolen or used, you, you call your credit card company, they typically, they, they, they eat that. If something happens with your Bitcoin and it's gone, you're on the hook. It's yours. Good luck trying to call any of these crypto exchanges and get a human on the line who can actually help you. No, no luck. In fact, sending an email or a text, they won't even respond in many cases. So it is truly, when you hear the term wild, wild west, absolutely, it is that. So you can lose your password. Your password could be stolen. Your account could be hacked. Your computer could be hacked. There's all those sorts of things. And there's nobody to go to to protect you. There are just literally thousands of lawsuits right now that have been filed by investors in different crypto exchanges because of money that's been lost. I don't know what kind of a chance they stand in, in a court of law in getting any of that back because they operated in an environment where there were no rules. How do you argue that they, that your, that your exchange was in, or that your uh, crypto company was, was unethical with you and then there's no real ethics rules there at all. So uh, that's the, that's the real danger of it. Um, and, you know, I mean, we haven't really experienced a widespread computer outage. I think just yesterday, in fact, I heard Amazon Web Services was down for a while. All the companies that rely on cloud computing 
were, were shut down for a period. Imagine something like that more widespread. Imagine a, a major government sponsored hack that literally took the entire internet down for a, a day or two. Imagine the impact that that would have if all of your assets were in digital form only and you couldn't get to them and there was no one behind you to protect them. That, there's some real serious dangers there. You know, again, you got historical price volatility. Um, you've got, there's been huge amounts of fraud that have happened. So I've got a list here of just a couple of them. Uh, co a company called Mt. Gox was one of the earlier ones back in 2011, one of the early cryptocurrency exchanges. $450 million worth of Bitcoin just disappeared. Poof. If you owned it, you're, it's gone. Tether was another one. Tether is a dollar, what's called a, uh, a, a stable coin that was tied to the dollar, was supposed to maintain a $1 price. $32 million stolen in 2017. AfriCrypt, the largest crypto exchange in Africa, this year lost $3.6 billion. Turns out the two founders took it and lift, disappeared. Now, here's a fascinating one. Also this year, a company called Poly Network, which is also a crypto exchange, $600 million was stolen by a hacker who hacked into their system because they had inadequate cyber controls. Believe it or not, this person said, I did this to, to highlight to you how unsafe your system is. If you'll listen to me so I can show you how to make it safe, I'll give you the entire 600 million back. And it actually happened. That I find amazing, but the next guy probably won't be so ethical. So those are the kind of risks you have to keep, keep in mind. And then you have big government intervention. China has literally shut down all of the exchanges in 2017. In 2021, they shut down all mining operations. Much of that has come to the United States since then. South Korea has banned initial coin offerings, which is one of the ways you create a brand new cryptocurrency. Um, EU regulators have been restricting in all sorts of different ways. Uh, one thing that hasn't happened is the US, and this is pretty fascinating, is that both uh, you know, Treasury Secretary Jay Powell, um, I'm sorry, Fed Chair Jay Powell, and also um, SEC Chair Gary Gensler have both said that they have no intentions of trying to outlaw cryptocurrencies in the United States. What they want to do instead is focus on how can we make this safe for investors? So the one thing that, that the early crypto people probably wanted least was government intervention. The greatest irony of this entire business is in order to gain legitimacy, that's exactly what they're going to need. Uh, and frankly, there's a lot going on. Um, yesterday, the CEOs of six of these exchanges testified in front of Congress on that very topic. So there is a lot going on in that way and more will happen over time. Central bank digital currencies, as I mentioned, one of the reasons that China shut down all the Bitcoin operations in China was because they created a digital version of the yuan, and it's run by, of course, the, People bank, the People's Bank of China. And essentially, the reason they did that was they want that to be the primary currency, and they don't want any competition. So they essentially outlawed the competition, which was all these other cryptocurrencies. The U.S. is working on the concept of a treasury-led digital currency. I believe we will have one here within a few years, uh, and it will work alongside of the dollar in many ways. I don't know that that wipes out cryptocurrencies. You know, you could still essentially buy Bitcoin as an investment, but it wouldn't necessarily be used to transact business. But I believe we'll see that in a while. Um, but there have been a lot of fraud. There's been enormous, there's been exchanges that started up, they advertise, people give them their money, and then they just disappear. This has happened many, many times. Now, here's a fascinating thing. The recent infrastructure bill that just went through Congress and was signed into law by the president just a few weeks ago, <clears throat> excuse me, has three key components in it. Now, these don't take effect until January of 2024, but they're very, very important. Crypto exchanges are going to be required to, to, have, to follow what's called the know your customer rule. That's something that Charles Schwab and all the other investment companies have to do. And that is, we need to basically know who you are what your net worth is, what your liquid net worth is, how much investing experience you have so that we can ensure that fraud and money laundering and all those things don't take place. They're going to require crypto exchanges to follow that same rule. They're also gonna to have to start reporting on cash deposits, or in this case, it would be transactions of $10,000 or more. Currently, if you walk into a bank or a broker and you deposit 10,000 in actual cash dollar bills, that, that will generate a report that that bank or financial institution has to file with the IRS. And then finally, and this one's critical, and it's also going to be very complex. As I said at the very beginning, when you buy or sell a cryptocurrency and you have potentially a capital gain or a capital loss, the way the IRS makes sure you pay your taxes 
is by comparing the 1099 that's generated, one that's sent to you by your financial institution, one that goes to them. That kind of reporting will also have to begin at the beginning of 2024. Now, all the details on those three laws have not been worked out. And since we've got a well over a year um, to make that take place, you'll hear a lot more discussion about that. But ultimately, these are some of the very first steps that have been put into place to try to make this business a little bit safer for people who actually want to invest. Now at Schwab, you cannot buy Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies directly. What you can do is get access to it indirectly through um, some of these funds, as I mentioned, ETFs that invest in cryptocurrency futures. There are also some funds out there that look like ETFs that are called grantor trusts. They're set up in Canada, not in the US that invest directly into cryptocurrencies but again, have some of the same issues where there's operating costs and so they don't track the underlying coins perfectly. You can buy Bitcoin futures directly if you have an account that has futures trading approval on it. Uh, and there are mutual funds out there that some of which invest directly into coins, some of which that invest into companies, some that invest into companies that have mining operations, some that invest in companies that create the technology uh, that run mining operations, all those sorts of things. And you, of course, can get quotes on those futures contracts directly on the Schwab trading platforms if you'd like. So with that, I know I've gone very fast. And uh, as I usually do, um, I probably went a little long, but I'll take questions for the next five or 10 minutes or however long we want to stay on here. And do you have some questions in the queue there? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Couple, yeah, I can. Um, but yeah, so one of the questions is, so you mentioned on there, when it comes to the uh, Bitcoin, there's like a Bitcoin foundation. Yes. And so what kind of control uh, does like the Bitcoin foundation have over uh, kind of Bitcoin? Because if it's supposed to be kind of a decentralized payment system, how, how, what kind of control does that foundation have? So they don't really have a lot of control. They have control over essentially the integrity of the code. They don't control the price, certainly. They don't own... Um, the, the transactions, or as I said, if you have something wrong, you can't necessarily go to them and say, hey, can you back me up like MasterCard does when my card got stolen? What they're essentially there to is to oversee um, the code to ensure that it continues to operate. And then at some point, if something happens that requires a change, as I mentioned, forks, where they need to decide whether you know, you're going to go down this path or that path, and they make ultimately make a decision on that. But, but frankly, it's not, uh, it's not a level of control. Uh, they certainly don't have any control over the regulations. In some cases, they have set up lobbying organizations uh, in D.C., and, you know, part of that is to try to uh, generate interest around making sure. And one of the reasons, as I mentioned earlier, there was a, there was a big uh, meeting yesterday where six of the CEOs of the bigger exchanges were in, in, uh, in, in Washington, testifying in front of the financial in front of the Financial Services Committee, primarily because they know regulation is coming and they want to help craft that, which is a smart thing to do. Um, they're not really trying to avoid regulation. I think they've all reached a point where they know that uh, cryptocurrencies are are too big to outlaw; they're too big to ignore. And so, what we have to do then is figure out how do we make them safe. And I think they all want to work together to craft that. So that's kind of where their focuses are. Wow, very very interesting. Um, there's another question here too about one of the slides. Uh, you mentioned when El Salvador adopted Bitcoin, there was actually a crash of about you know roughly 16%. I think that's kind of interesting just because you think of a large country is adopting it, like that would actually make the price go up as you think like more people would then be buying the coin, so it would make it more uh, you know or less available. So uh, is there any thoughts or why that even happened or? Yeah, so part of it was just simply the just the idea. I mean, can you imagine if if even if you had six months warning, if all of a sudden we knew that uh, you know effective January one that the, the U.S. dollar was no longer going to be the means by which we do all of our business? Imagine the culture shock that that would create. And and as I said, part of the problem was the fact that El Salvador is a relatively poor country, and there are many many millions of people in that country that don't have access to the internet. Even in this country, that there's a huge portion of the population that don't have access to high-speed internet. Um, some people are either don't have it at all or it's very slow. Imagine if your ability to sort of do any sort of business to get paid by your paycheck, to go to the grocery store, whatever that was, was limited only to your ability to do that through the internet and you didn't have that access. Imagine the problems you'd have. So 
it was pretty challenging. Uh, and that's part of it. And it's also because now you have a gigantic player in a marketplace that's already extremely volatile. So there were a lot of different factors involved in it. Uh, it, it didn't go well at first. And I think that one of the, the concerns was that they would abandon it. I mean, almost the same day that it happened. Uh, and so that created this volatility. And you know what? Uncertainty always breeds fear. And when there's fear, the first instinct for everybody is to just hit the sell button. Gotcha. I got another question here. Uh, do you recommend any resources to find any additional information on cryptocurrency? Um, well, I mean, there's tons of stuff out there. What I would recommend is make sure that you, you know, don't go to like, you know, a Reddit chat room to get your advice on investing in cryptocurrencies. There are lots and lots and lots of purported experts out on the internet and everywhere that are just like there are for penny stocks and every other thing out there that will profess to be experts and don't know a whole lot of anything. Um, what I can say is that nobody has a, an accurate method for assessing the value of a cryptocurrency or how much it ought to be worth. You can use technical analysis, but even that again has a very short history. It's not proven to be very good. Ultimately you do it because there is no fundamental analysis, right? I mean, that doesn't really even exist. Uh, so, uh, but there's a lot, there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, I put out a fair amount of commentary. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff on the Schwab website. Uh, we do have a website. I, I hope it's okay to kind of share this website. Is it sure, absolutely. Yeah, so schwab.com forward slash cryptocurrency is a, uh, a web, what we call a crypto hub that we just set up literally, I'd say less than two months ago. And there are, uh, there's a lot of articles, there are FAQs in there. Um, some of some of it, them I wrote, uh, some I didn't, uh, some I contributed to, and there are lots of links in there to some other articles and FAQs and things that we have uh, within Schwab. Again, I think probably the best place to get advice on any kind of investing is to from a, a reputable source. And, you know, again, Schwab has no nothing to gain right at this moment on this particular issue. Uh, when people say, well, why don't you trade cryptos? I go for the same reason you can't buy a Picasso here or an antique Ferrari or a block of gold. We just, that's not the business we're in. We do stocks, bonds, options, mutual funds. That's what we do, ETFs. Um, but we can be a source for reason and guidance, I think. And I just put the link up on the screen for you there. Um, Randy, talk a little bit more. I know you had said one time about, you know, 200 years ago in this country, there was no U.S. dollar. Banks had their own currencies. Talk a little bit about that, because I find that fascinating. I, I was at the uh, Bureau of uh, Federal Bureau of uh, Printing and Engraving a few years ago before COVID and was just fascinated to watch money being printed. And then in the museum kind of outside of there that showed there was a thousand dollar bill and a five hundred dollar bill, like just some of that history. But I don't remember seeing a section talking about you know, banks having different currencies. I, I've read about that a long time ago and forgot about it, but, and, and then what parallels you might see here with crypto and, and 7,000 different uh, flavors of crypto. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I can't remember the exact dates, but I mean, it goes back certainly the late 1800s, even as far back as, as recently as that, the, there lots of banks created their own currencies. And when banks had to, when the, when, before the federal reserve system was created, there wasn't really a central dollar. And of course, you know, during the Civil War, um, there was a whole new set of currencies created in the South with the Confederacy. But to, in order to transact business and to have a unified United States, you kind of have to have a single currency. What I, the parallels I draw is mostly this, that I, I guess I said, I don't think cryptocurrencies are going to wait. They're, they're too big to ignore. They're too big to go away. They're too big to outlaw. But at the same time, I think it's crazy to imagine that there will be 7,000 different currencies available that we could all transact business in. Uh, what will happen is what we've seen in many other industries. There will be enormous amounts of consolidation. In fact, we saw a little bit of that already this year. Uh, some of these will be wiped out, some of them won't. If I had to guess, I would say a, a, a coin like Bitcoin because of its original, because, because of it being the original, because of its limited quantity, because of how it was set up, um, will could will likely remain as just simply an investable asset, like again owning gold. Whereas these more uh, dollar tied coins like the like Tether and others that are linked to the dollar that try to maintain a one dollar value will more likely become a currency um, that we'll use to transact business. I don't know about you, but I don't want my the value of my dollar moving five or ten percent in a day. You know, a hundredth of a percent is plenty. Uh, so I think that will happen. But here's the funny thing, and this is, again is another paradox here, is that when you use a replacement for the dollar that's a digital 
uh, asset like uh, like a tether or something that's designed to be a dollar for a dollar. The only way you can protect the value of that and also maintain the value of that is if there is a collateral uh, in an account somewhere that's made up of dollar equivalent securities, you know, overnight repos and commercial paper and treasuries and all these things. Well, somebody has to hold those. And when you when you talk about decentralized finance, uh, this is where the misnomer comes in. And this is the part I think people don't talk enough about. And I've been emphasizing this a lot lately is you're not really decentralizing the finance. What you're really doing is you are re-centralizing the finance. You're re-centralizing it away from the Federal Reserve and into some unregulated, uh, unlicensed, lightly overseen, um, unaccountable bank-like entity, if you will. I don't really see how that makes it any safer. And to me, that's a whole less, a lot less safe. That's a whole lot less safe. And it's really not decentralized because now instead of a bank watching it, you've got somebody like the Tether company uh, watching it. Well, I don't even know who those guys are. And I don't know where they are. I don't know how to get in touch with them. I don't know um, whether they're honest or dishonest. I don't know how safe their cybersecurity is. That's a real concern. That's one of the reasons why one of the biggest focuses of the discussion they had yesterday. And when you hear people like, um, and then again, this isn't a positive or negative about anyone in Congress, but people like Elizabeth Warren, like Janet Yellen, uh, like Gary Gensler, uh, like uh, you know Secretary uh, Jay Powell, all of them talking about the true risk is in these stable coins because then it really isn't decentralized. It's just being moved to someone else who has a, who's a lot less credible source. That's one of the real dangers that, so I think that's kind of where most of the focus is probably going to be. Okay, do we have any other questions? I know we've uh, come up on just right about an hour here. We wanted to try to keep it there. Is there anything else? No, don't really see any. Okay, well, Randy, I'd like to thank you very much. I feel like uh, every time I listen to you, I learn more, uh, even though I've heard uh, a good part of your presentation many times before, but uh, this is great. I'm glad to see you publishing some content uh, for everybody, schwab.com forward slash cryptocurrencies, plural, is the uh, link. Okay, I wanted to make sure I got that right. It's up on the screen, so you can always go there and, and get great insight from our partners at Schwab, who, who we trust, and um, actually they're the largest custodian out there and, and do a great job every day uh, protecting uh, our clients' assets. So with that, thank you very much for your time today, and uh, we'll see you again uh, real soon. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having okay. me. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks Andy. Bye, everybody. Bye.